so it's a uh, uh, great emotion to to be here for uh, in the Jean Jacques Lafont uh, theater to uh, give uh, this Jean Jacques Lafont lecture. Since I I, I, I will. I will say a few words about Jean-Jacques uh, at the City Hall uh, later on, but uh, let me say that uh, this has been an, an incredible adventure. I remember Jean-Jacques in 1982, the first time I met him uh, in Paris. And, you know, in Paris, there is nothing one can do. And we, have, I will do something else uh, somewhere else and say, who is this uh, Don Quixote? Uh, who is, uh, you know, pretends he will do this, he will do that. And then I saw step by step each time he would announce the next step. And the next step looked impossible possible each time and the next step he uh, overperformed the next step and he went through step to step and I discovered this fantastic place uh, this beautiful building the uh, incredible PhD students uh, uh, and uh, really the uh, the great achievement and uh, that went well beyond I think anything that Jean-Jacques could have uh, dreamed of and uh, and to see if I, well, to be uh, to have the privilege to witness the various steps uh, since uh, for the past 40 years uh, has been quite something and uh, and you know we know we are in pessimistic times and we are time where we think this is the end of it everything is those are uh, gloomy uh, gloomy gloomy months gloomy years and I think uh, you, those are the times where you have to say no. I mean, uh, anything can be done if you have the the persistence, the the motivation, the, uh, and and you can go you can go against the system as Jean Jacques was always doing. He, he had to he had to go against the system to to change the system, uh, and uh, uh, and he showed how much you know this uh, uh, this willpower can achieve. Quoi. And and. Uh, uh, well, no, that's. Uh, I think that should be an example for anyone, you know, with doubts, who thinks that there, there, there's nothing one can do, and uh, uh, it's just. Uh, it's exactly anybody should come to Toulouse these days to uh, to uh, recharge the battery, quoi, and. and uh, because that's uh, well, it's a, it's a fantastic achievement anyway. But I will go back. I will I'll say a few more things uh, uh, in the city hall. But anyway, it's extremely moving, and to see Colette, and to see all my friends, and uh, uh, voilà, and to be here to give uh, to deliver this lecture. So let me, without further ado, uh, let me start. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm already dehydrated. Alors, usually uh, there is a side that said with me the big suspense is when, when I will weather and when I will fall off the stage. But here it's safe because there is no stage. But I can still fall, but it's kind of safe because uh, the worst that can happen to me is to get. Uh, that's right, there's no stage to fall off. That's already a big. Uh, okay, so let me start. So uh, um, I, have, uh, I have this. So here is a, a photograph of Young Schumpeter, and uh, uh, and it's true when in economy, you know, I would take uh, I/O classes, uh, for example, at Harvard with uh, Richard Caves, and he would talk about Schumpeter. But I had come across, and I thought, well, glad uh, this idea of creative destruction, you know, that uh, new innovations displace old technologies, uh, that looks pretty smart, quoi. and. Uh, and in various writings, uh, Schumpeter laid out this uh, this concept, this idea. But you know, when I was a student, uh, the, there was uh, it was nowhere. It was a curiosity. It was absolutely not in mainstream economics. Uh, uh, you would study growth. You would study the solo model, which is a beautiful model, which is really a model of a model. Quoi. Uh, you you, de you describe the whole world with two equations. One equation tells you how you produce output with labor and capital. And, uh, and the second equation tells you how you accumulate capital with savings minus depreciation. And, uh, and, and that, that was the, the, the framework. And then, of course, you would say, well, you can do something a bit more sophisticated with the Ramsey model and this. But all were those were models of growth based on capital accumulation. But in fact, which show that under reasonable assumptions, uh, uh, here is uh, Bob Solo. Uh, uh, under reasonable assumptions, uh, uh, that's the paper that gave him the Nobel Prize. It was published my my birth date, 1956, <laughs> but uh, gave him the Nobel Prize in 1987. Uh, 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 showed that under reasonable assumptions of decreasing returns to capital accumulation. Uh, you cannot get long-run growth of per capita GDP just relying on capital accumulation. You need something else, and the something else is technical progress. 
But Bob Solo would not tell you where technical problems comes from. I said, yeah, but, you know, could maybe it comes from the thing that Schumpeter mentioned, but there was no Schumpeterian model and there was no Schumpeterian empirics. So uh, I met Peter Howitt at MIT in, uh, in, uh, in the fall of 87 and, uh, uh, and, I, and I, we were neighbors there, and Jean remembers you were there. And, and, uh, um, and, and I, I walked into Peter's office, which I said to mine, we used to talk to each other. And I said, why don't we try to write a growth model that embodies uh, creative destruction? And that's what we started to do in the fall of 1987. Okay. And we, we built a model that revolved around three main ideas. The first idea is that long-run growth is driven by a cumulative process of innovation where each innovator builds upon previous innovation. Okay, so you always stand on giant shoulders of your predecessors. Uh, the second idea is that innovations result from entrepreneurial activities that are motivated by the prospect of innovation, right? You, you innovate because you will get a new product or a cheaper way to do things that will give you, give you runs for a while until someone does better than you do. Okay, and the third idea is creative destruction, new innovations, displace old technologies, make old technologies obsolete. But you see right away that at the, at the heart of the growth process, you have a contradiction. On the one hand, you need innovation runs to motivate innovation. But then on the other hand, yesterday's innovators, they want to use those runs to prevent subsequent innovation. And, and regulating capitalism is largely about how to manage this contradiction. Schumpeter himself was very pessimistic about capitalism because he thought that the first innovators would turn into entrenched incumbents that would stall any new entry. And in fact, a lot of his worries reproduce all the time. So, uh, but where he was totally pessimistic, we are exactly, I would have said Gramscian optimist, I should say Lafon optimist uh, here, you see? We believe that there is the optimism of the will, you, when you want, of the researcher. There, is a, there are forces that can help you avert the negative outcome that Schumpeter uh, predicted, okay? And, and uh, that's what I want to argue with you today, okay? So that, this uh, growth uh, framework, uh, in fact, completely changed the landscape. I don't want to, I don't want to say bad things about other growth models, okay? Mm. But it's a, it's a fact that this new paradigm changed the landscape. Why? Because we give center stage. We, it's we and all people who worked on this. Now you have people like Pete Klino, Ufu Kaksigit, uh, 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 Michael Peters, Fabrizio Zilibot. It's a whole range of, of you know, researchers that, uh, that work in the Schumpeterian uh, uh, you know, uh, growth. And, and the, what's special about the Schumpeterian growth economics is that it gives center stage to cross-term heterogeneity. It's a world where you have incumbents and entrants. It's a world where you have leaders and followers. It's a world where you have small and large firms. None of that in previous growth models. Everybody is the same. And all the action, all what's interesting, it it's, comes from this heterogeneity. So you miss the whole thing if you don't have that heterogeneity, okay? And uh, also what's important that this paradigm gives center stage to firm dynamics. You are in a world where you start, I start by entering with one activity. I, I center because, for example, I do better than you. And uh, I innovate on you and up, you are up and I, I, I enter, okay? But then I may do better than uh, Christian and I, I move into, we come from one activity firm to a two activity firm. And that's how I grow. But I may shrink also because maybe if uh, someone else, uh, you know, Patrick, uh, uh, Rep, Patrick Wiesbian, may innovate upon one of my activities and I may shrink. So I grow because I keep innovating on other people's things and that's how I grow. I exit if I am a one activity firm and someone innovates on me, that's how I exit. So you have a theory of entry, growth, shrinking, exit. And you have a very natural way to put firm dynamics. And, and it relates to the growth process, okay? And that's what, and it's a, it's a growth uh, theory that you test all the time with micro data. It's all about cross firm, firm level data, uh, very micro data, no more uh, rubbish cross country regression, no more rubbish AK, that's finished. Quoi. You go into microeconometrics and you do a back and forth between theory and empirics uh, all the time, okay? Uh, that's the that's uh, that's all what it's all about. Okay, so uh, first part is that the, this theory has distinctive predictions. Okay, so uh, a distinctive prediction first is that growth is positively correlated with firm turnover. 
So uh, there are various ways you can measure turnover by job creation, job destruction, or by firm churning, firm creation, firm destruction. And you see that in areas or regions or countries where you have more turnover, you tend to have higher productivity growth. Voilà, a work by Davis Salty Wonger and others document that uh, and others since then. Okay, there is another interesting thing. I told you that you, you, you have firm dynamics because I enter, I innovate on Patrick, and then I keep innovating. Maybe I may shrink and exit. But uh, 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 it's, this theory will give you, of course, that you tend to have a positive relationship between firm age and firm size. When I, when I arrive, I have one activity. And then I grow little by little. I may shrink in the middle. And then, but on average, there is a positive relationship between firm size and firm age. So for example, Clino and Shang Tai Se have documented about this relationship. In the US, it's very steep because when you're US, when you are good, you get the financing. And uh, when you are not good, you are driven out by the good. So those who are surviving, they get financing and they have a higher growth potential because if they didn't, they would be selected out. So that's why the US curve is much steeper than, for example, the Mexican. We are, we are between Mexico and the US in France. And the idea is that we should come, we become steeper uh, with the reforms, you know, labor market and other reforms, uh, competition and all that. We, we are still, uh, clo too close to Mexico, not enough too close to US. Okay, and of course, this theory tells you right away that you, the exit rate, here we look at the exit rate by age, the younger firms, which are also the smaller firms, tend to exit at a higher rate than the larger firms. Because if I am a very young firm, I have only one activity. It takes one creative destruction for me to be driven out. If I am a, two, a firm a holder, I tend to have more activities. It takes more creative destructions for me to be driven. So you see how very naturally the uh, facts about exit rates of firms by age, the relationship between firm size and firm age, the firm size distribution, you get that very naturally with it. With the other growth models, you have no clue about what happens with firm dynamics, okay? So that's the first thing, turnover and growth, okay? A second prediction is that there is a, a competition uh, fosters innovation close to the technological frontier and discourages it far from the frontier. Mm. Mm. I will get that. So imagine, I always take this image, suppose you are a classroom and suppose you are, you are equally good, but suppose some of you are the top of the class and some of you are the bottom of the class. And I open the door and I let a very good element in, a very good researcher comes in. What will happen? The top of the class will work harder to remain the top of the class those are the blue uh, the, those are the those are the blue firms that the firms close to the frontier close to the technological frontier in their sector and the orange firms are those who are far from the frontier they they were already discouraged being at the bottom of the class they will be even more discouraged when i let this student this new element this very good student in in the class okay and that's true also for and of course when you, the more developed if you are a more developed country you have a, a higher share of blue firms compared with orange firms. So the more developed the country is, the closer a country is to the world technology frontier on average, the more growth enhancing uh, competition is because you have more blue firms compared with orange firms. Okay, that's, that's the kind of things you can say with the, with the firm. Alors let me do, I will do two kind, three things with this, uh, 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 with this paradigm. I will show how we can use the paradigm to revisit some main enigma in economic history. Second thing, I will question some common wisdom. I love to have friends you know, or, or colleagues who sometimes they come with ideas I don't agree with on policy. And I love to, to say, bow, bow, bow. no, I don't agree with your ideas. And I, <laughs> So that's, uh, I'm very grateful for them to have to come up with this, uh, avec ces mauvaises idées. And, uh, uh, and then uh, I will end up with Rethink the Future of Capitalism, which is the, the title of the talk. Are you still alive? Oh, okay, good. So I will start with the uh, historical enigma. The first enigma is the uh, secular stagnation. So in fact, uh, the enigma is that in the US, but it's true in other countries as well. The, uh, the average yearly rate of productivity growth, of TFP growth, went down a lot since the 2000s. So you can see here the average uh, yearly TFP growth rate in the US goes down a lot in the early 2000s. And it might be a surprise after going up a lot between 95 2005. 
And you might think it's a surprise because you know you had the AI, the IT revolution, the AI revolution. You should have you know a boosted growth, and you see growth going down. How come? And you see that's true, particularly in IT producing sectors, which is the black line, and the IT using sectors which is the gray line. And in fact, the most plausible explanation is very Schumpeterian, is that in fact what you had is that during, thanks to the IT revolution, you had the emergence of the superstar firms. Uh, so the work by Autor uh, et al, or by others have, have uh, emphasized this uh, phenomenon of superstar. We talk about the GAFAM. Uh, uh, the, so these firms uh, with very good social capital, they knew how to take advantage of the IT revolution, Walmart, uh, uh, Google, uh, 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 Microsoft, uh, Facebook, to, uh, you know, to, to spread out. And so at first they boosted growth. But then what happened is that through merger and acquisition in particular, they become, you know, pervasive. And they ended up discouraging new entry and new innovation. And that's why you see, you look at the entry rate of new firms, uh, uh, and you see that whether small firms or firms, as of the early 2000s, the growth, the, the, entry, there is a rate, the entry rate declines. So in fact, there is a discouragement of, of, of entry. So you see, you, you have those firms, they, it's very much the Schumpeter syndrome. They innovate, they become tentacular. And then they end up discouraging entry by new innovating firms. And in fact, you have a phenomenon which is important, and the locker account Unger, but also Bakay Fari found exactly the same. If you look at markups, average markup, which is the red curve, goes up, but not so much because within firm it goes up. The within firm markup is the blue line, is because uh, it's because it's a reallocation effect. The superstar firms, which are high markup firms, low labor share firms, became more pervasive. And that's why the markup has gone up. So you're, that really shows that you had this phenomenon of, you know, uh, big firms, this big emergence of these new superstar firms that ended up uh, discouraging entry and growth. Alors there, you know, Gordon would say it's, uh, it's the end of it. We have secular stagnation we cannot do. Schumpeter would tell you we are pessimistic. But then there are people like Richard Gilbert and others who say, no, you have to reform competition policy. It's too much market definition, market share oriented. You should more, you should to a bigger extent factor in uh, entry and innovation in the decision whether or not to allow for merger and acquisition. In more generally, you should have, you should adapt competition policy to the digital era. So the, where we are uh, Lafont optimist is we say, no, you can reform competition policy. In fact, the Biden administration a year ago reformed competition policy. And the hope is that the, that will allow and there are other things you can do to, to limit the power of the superstar firms and, 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 and favor the, the entry of new innovating firms. And that's the way to counteract, uh, uh, you see, this secular stagnation. So that's one phenomenon, okay? Another phenomenon is the middle income trap. I know that's bad because middle income trap, the initial is MIT, but there's nothing bad, I don't want to. I love MIT and that's where we, we, we work with Peter Howitt. Uh, uh, so for example, if you look at Korea, you look at South Korea, you look at the average annual growth rate of per capita GDP. You see it's very high starting after the war in 1960. See that it declines. In fact, you see Korea had what we call a catch-up growth, two ways to grow. Uh, that's very much based on work with Don and, and Fabrizio. So, uh, uh, one way is to catch up with the technological frontier. A bar is the frontier. So this is catching up growth or imitation, if you want. And you can also grow by innovating upon yourself, innovating at the frontier. You move from A to gamma A, where gamma is greater than one. That's frontier innovation. When you are way below A bar, it's the main source of growth is this, the mu M. But when, you, when A becomes close to A bar, the main source of growth becomes frontier innovation. The problem with Korea is during the catching up period, the, you have big conglomerates that emerge, always the problem of the big conglomerates. They are called showballs. Anybody from Korea here? Nobody from Korea because uh, then I, yes, you are. So how you pronounce it? Show, well, but you have your mask. So you just, roll, roll, roll. We don't understand. Huh? Showballs, voilà, showballs, voilà. You see? So the showballs, and the, what happened with the showballs, not only they inhibited entry of new firms, but they also somehow, we believe, uh, uh, put pressure on government not to move to, from institutions that are good for UM to, into institutions that are good for UN. In particular, I showed you already 
that if you are in the business of frontier innovation, competition is very important. So Korea should have moved increasingly towards more openness and more competition, but they didn't because this conglomerate prevented it. But there is a good thing is that a good thing and good and good, good. They had the crisis, the financial crisis in the late 90s and the late 90s, the, it had one good effect. It weakened the power of the conglomerates of the chobols and that allowed for more entry and it allowed for moving to more openness and more pro-competition policies in Korea. And that's why you have this slot, this growth resuming here, but then again goes down. But you had at least this temporary boost in growth. And you can look at innovation, and we've done that with Sergei Gureyev, and you could see that the, the crisis and the, the weakening effect it had on showballs boosted uh, entry and also prompted a, a move of, of the Korean government towards more competition and more openness. So that's an interesting thing about the middle, the middle income trap. I'll come back to this, uh, this issue of government being captured by firms. Okay, the last one, the third one is my debate with PKT. Okay, ah, blood, blood, blood. No, not all, I highest respect for Thomas. Okay. Made you laugh, it's true. <laughs> but so uh, here is a, a, a here is a picture which nobody will discuss. It's, I think a very important findings, and I think that that would also was a very important contribution to economics is to put give provide evidence that in U.S. but also in other developed countries the share of income of the top one percent income earners has increased a lot since the 1980. Uh, that's the share of income of the top 1% U.S. income earners, that the share of income of the top 0.1%. And uh, the question is, so that's nobody discusses, okay? It's well established by the work of, of, of uh, Thomas, uh, Emmanuel, and uh, Antonia Kinson. Uh, the question is why? And the, there is one driver. Uh, uh, so the basic story is that there are, I call that Carlos Slim versus Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs becomes rich because he invents Apple. Mr. Sky becomes rich in Sweden because he invents Skype, okay? Uh, 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 those are inventors. Uh, but you have Carlos Slim. And I, know, I know there is at least one person from Mexico. One day he will say, I'm, I'm Carlos Slim's son, who no few. Uh, I make sure there was no Slim in the room, but no problem. Uh, Carlos Slim might have become be an innovator in his youth, but what I witnessed uh, during the years I was married with a Mexican uh, uh, friend, I mean, uh, uh, is that uh, he became a head of an unregulated or poorly regulated monopoly in telecoms that was privatized. And I remember when I had to make a phone call to Mexico, it would cost 10 times the, the cost uh, of making a phone call elsewhere. Uh, um, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and so that's, voilà, you have Carlos Slim versus Steve Jobs. In, in my world, they are both. So, and why is it important? Because innovation is a source of top income inequality. Why? Because I told you innovation, you get rents from innovating. And those rents make you more likely to move to the top income bracket. But it is a good source of, of top income because innovation gives you growth. So that's one good thing. But it turns out it has also good other good things to it. It increases social mobility, particularly innovations by new entrants. Why? Because of creative destruction. When they enter, they replace someone. You see, they, they move up because someone moves down. You see what I mean? And that creates social mobility. And because innovation increases top income inequality on the one hand, but increases social mobility on the other hand, if you look at the effect on global inequality, innovation does not increase global inequality. Oh, now you might think that I pretend that, but that's very much the work I did with uh, uh, Axigit, Bergeau, Blandel, and Emus in the Review of Economic Studies. We used uh, cross US panel data and, uh, 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 and, we and we looked, we ranked state year, so the same state in a year and another year, maybe here. So if it's high innovation intensity in one year, it's, it's here. If it's low intensity of innovation is there. We measure innovation intensity by the volume of, of citation weighted patents, okay? And what we see is that the continuous curve gives you the effect. In fact, we show it's causal of uh, innovation intensity on top income inequality in the state in that year. And you see there is a positive relationship. The more innovation intensity there is in the state in a year, the higher 
the share of income of the top 1% income earners in that state in that year. So that's clear. It is a source of top income inequality. But if now you look at the effect of innovation intensity on the Gini, which is a more global measure of inequality, you see no effect. So innovation is a good source of top income because it gives you growth, it gives you social mobility, and as a result, it does not increase global inequality. So I would take it. And in fact, if you look at uh, the effect on social mobility, we're using the same thing at uh, data as Chetty et al. in their 2015 QGE paper. You see that uh, in, the, uh, you, uh, in the commuting zones that have higher social mobility uh, innovation, you are also those where you have higher social mobility. And you can show it's really innovation by entrance that dominate. It's really the entrance innovation that drives social mobility. Okay, so that's interesting. Another thing also which is interesting, we relate something we discussed in the Blanchard Tyrol report, has to do with soft skills and good jobs. Uh, what happens, another virtue of innovating firms is that they create more good jobs. A good job is a job that leads to promotion of the workers. So here we look, uh, those are based, is based on UK data. Uh, we look at unskilled labor. So they didn't go beyond high school. And uh, we look at the evolution of the salary of an unskilled worker in an, in an innovating firm that patents, that's the continuous curve, and the, evolu and the evolution in a non-innovating firm, which is a dotted curve. And you can see that at any age, the innovating firm pays more a non-skilled labor. And you can see that the unskilled labor, the wage goes up by more. You see what I mean? You have better prospects of wage increase because in fact, they create more what we call uh, good jobs. Good jobs are jobs that enhance soft skills. You know, you have the hard skills that you learn at school, but you have the soft skills which are typically, you know, how you interact with other people in the firm. Are you trustworthy, etc. Those are soft skills. And innovating firms needs much more of that because if you screw up in, a, in an innovating firm, it's much worse than if you scrub in a non-innovating firm. So it's, that's another good aspect of innovating of innovation is that it also enhances social mobility because innovating firms tend to create more good jobs that mean jobs that enhance soft skills, okay? So that's another plus of, of innovation, okay? So that's the thing. But by contrast, lobbying, it has all, all wrong. What is lobbying? Lobbying is what the Chobols did with the government of Korea to prevent new entry. Lobbying is the incumbents that lobby to, uh, uh, to make sure that the government will not implement competition policy and will not let in new entrants. So lobbying also is a source of rents, of course, but it's a bad one because it reduces innovative entry, so it's bad for growth. It's bad for social mobility because I told you that entrant innovation is good for social mobility, but of course lobbying will reduce it. And because it increases top income inequality and reduces social mobility, lobbying will increase global inequality. So it has all wrong. And you can see that, uh, uh, you know, I, I redo the same thing with lobbying. The, the, state, the US states, with high lobbying, you see high top, uh, share of income of the top 1%, but you also see that they have a, a high share, uh, they have a high Gini as well, whereas you remember that innovation would have no effect on the, on the Gini. So you have the good source. In Piketty's world, you only have Carlos Slims. And in my world, you have Carlos Slims and Steve Jobs, and you cannot treat them exactly the same way. Now, whether you are Carlos Slim or a Steve Jobs, I still have to make sure that your wealth is not used to prevent future entry. That you can do through taxation, but you can also do through competition. And now I'm working currently with, on the project with Blondel, Bozio, and other co-authors, where we show that you should look jointly at, at taxation and competition when you want to look at, at inequality and growth. You cannot look at them separately. You have to look jointly at competition and taxation. Okay? And that's what I wanted to say on inequality. So now I'm done with this part. Are you still alive? Ah! Good. Let's take. Uh, let's have a big breath. We get to the now. We get to the uh, killing the bad ideas. Okay. Let's kill bad ideas. Let me, uh, let me have uh, uh, some uh, water. Ah. Oh, il y a plenty. Oh là là, Florence, merci. Hein. Oh là là, qu'est-ce que c'est sympa. C'est vrai que je m'en aurais besoin quand même. Hein. Parce que quand j'aurai tué toutes les mauvaises idées, ça sera vide là. Il y aura plus rien là. Voilà. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I will take three ideas. One is that subsidizing incumbent firms fosters innovation. The second idea, taxing robots protects employment. The third idea is that negative growth is the way to stop climate change, la décroissance, okay? Which is great in France. It's a fantastic laboratory of bad ideas. All the bad ideas we have, it's fantastic. No, I think we, the world should be grateful to us. 
Is that when I showed during COVID, you know, la, 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 la testation de déplacement dérogatoire J'ai montré à la télé, j'ai dit, c'est pour le monde entier. Regardez ce qu'il ne faut pas faire. Vous voyez, regardez ça. Voilà. Anyway, so, uh, so, uh, uh, the, so, the, uh, so in particular, uh, 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 you can show why is it bad in a nutshell Subsidizing innovation is not a bad thing in itself, but you have to be a, a non-Schumpeterian would say no problem, subsidize R&D and it will go well. But the, a Schumpeterian would say, whoa, 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 be careful, because if you subsidize too much incumbents, it might be at the expense of entrance. You will raise the entry cost because you know they are competing on scarce resources, like for example, scientists or scarce labor. So if you subsidize too much incumbents, you may raise the cost of entry and possibly entry by better people that may be better than the incumbents that you subsidize, okay? And that's why you have to be careful when you do industrial policy, you have to always factor in the effect on entry. A non schumpeterian will have no problem, subsidize, subsidize, okay? But the Schumpeterian will say, whoa, 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 whoa. what's the effect on entry, okay? And uh, for example, we, uh, uh, credit, uh, you may think that easing credit on financial financially constrained incumbents is always good for innovation. Well, it's good up to a certain point because it may uh, 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 reduce exit or it may look lead to zombie farm saying and zombie taking resources away from potentially good entrants and that you don't want to have that. Yeah? So if you start from, uh, so for example, here I have mu is the financial development that you see, uh, suppose the uh, incumbent firms, each time they innovate, they multiply productivity by gamma i, uh, new firms multiply productivity by gamma e, where gamma e is bigger. But you see increasing mu, of course, it's good for the R&D and innovation rate of incumbent, but it's, it's bad for the entry rate. And you have this trade-off. And because you have this trade-off, typically, the relationship is like that. From no high financial constraint, initially, it's like what King and Levin would say, you would favor growth by increasing financial development. But there is a moment where this effect there kicks in and make you go down. And that's something you would not have. And we did, although you might say that this is just theoretical, I don't want to go into details, but we explored the Mario Draghi to get out to avoid the recession of 2012, we took a certain number of steps. One step was to uh, introduce the additional credit claims program. Uh, in the euro area, banks can pledge corporate loans as collateral in their refinancing operation with the central bank, as long as these loans are sufficient quality, okay? And you can say, well, all uh, pri uh, before Draghi, all ratings plus three plus plus to five, well, the, the smaller the number, the better you are. The bigger the number, the worse you are. These guys were getting, the, uh, you could use before Draghi, uh, uh, banks could use loans to uh, A category A firms for, uh, to financing with the ECB. Uh, they could use those as collateral, but not B and C. And what Draghi has done is to say, now I will add four to the group. So I will cut here. And that's beautiful because you can do a different deal. Draghi, after the implementation of the program, you can, uh, uh, Draghi extends the AGDD criterion to include firm rated four in the Bank of France rating, okay? And, uh, 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 and in fact, what you will see is that it increased productivity growth for the incumbents, but it reduced exit in particular for the least productive firms. So you see what happens here is the access to loans of the four and five plus. You see they are identical up to the ACC. And then you see now the, the, that's the access by the, by the four and that's the access by the five plus. So you see Draghi, the one that Draghi takes, they have good access and the other one get bad access. And now you see the effect on growth, but you see that the effect on growth is uh, post uh, the, of ACC is positive on, on, on productivity growth, but the effect on exit is negative and is particularly negative for low productivity, uh, for low productivity firms. So it's, what's very interesting is that uh, uh, you reduce the exit, particularly for the lame ducks. And that of course makes entry more difficult. And that's the downside of Draghi. Alors, maybe when Draghi did it, it was okay because it was a big recession, but you had a zombie effect. And the non schumpeterian model would, would ignore the zombie effect. Okay. Are you alive still? Yes. Wow, you're fantastic. You're fantastic. It was not at all obvious to get up to that point. Okay. So let's have another uh, drink. Okay. So now uh, another one. Taxing robots protects employment. So that's a, a big debate I had with Darren. 
as I said this morning, when I write a paper with Darren, I, I, I have my wind behind, you know, I travel from Boston to Paris, five hours, uh, it was very fast. When I have Darren against me, it's as if I travel westward, you know, I have the wind against me and uh, the trip is much longer. And so that was the thing. So papers were produced saying, you know, robotization is a bad idea because it destroyed jobs. And we even have a presidential candidate in 2017 in France who advocated taxing robots. He did beautifully well under the advice of some of my friends above, above mentioned. Uh, uh, and uh, okay, and he said tax robots, but it's fantastic. I love these ideas. I love them to, to have the pleasure of killing them. Okay, so uh, recent work with uh, Sylvain Antonin, Simon Binet, Xavier Jaravel, and we, uh, we, we showed, so we have various measures so that's uh, modern uh, industrial equipment, firms that automate, we use various measures, modern investment equipment, you see the increased employment, uh, 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 the ASEMO glue, as own automation measure, uh, robots, whatever measure you use, you see that firms that automate, they create employment. And why do they create employment? It's true that you have some substitution, your replacement of labor by capital. But when you automate, you become more productive. When you become more productive, you lower the quality adjusted price of your goods. So you increase your market worldwide. Because you increase your market worldwide, there is more demand for your product. And therefore, you employ more. So if now I tax these firms, I prevent them from employing more. I, I shoot myself in the feet. Exactly the thing I don't want to do. At least in France, maybe, maybe uh, in Liechtenstein, it's different. Quoi. But I haven't seen the Liechtensteinian paper yet. But in France, it's a very bad idea. Okay? So that's what uh, uh, I steal business from other firms by, when I automate but mostly firms abroad in France, well, for the French firms. So that's what happens. And you can see firms that automate, they increase their sales, they increase their export sales, and of course they reduce employment in competing firms in the same sector. But when you are an open economy, the business stealing is mostly to firms abroad. So for you, it's good. If you are completely closed at the industry level, you would lose on the one hand, but you gain on the other, okay? And that might explain why none of the big industrial revolutions, starting with steam engine, and then the, the, uh, the electricity uh, produce mass unemployment. You know, when you had the, you know, the steam engine, there was the, the Luddites movement, you know, the fear that you would have mass unemployment in England. It did not happen. When you had the electricity revolution, Keynes predicted mass unemployment in the US never happened because you have this productivity effect that's there to counteract the, uh, uh, the, the other effect, okay? So that's one, one idea. And another one is negative growth to stop climate change. But then, of course, you know, it's always intimidating for to stop to talk about climate change on Christian. Uh, but uh, uh, so, you know, uh, uh, it's true that historically, temperature has started to rise when growth has started to rise. It's true that historically, the partisans of la décroissance, they can say, well, look at these curves. You know, exactly if you look at the, at the uh, Madison curve of uh, world per capita GDP, it's exactly flat up to the 1820, 1850, and then it starts taking off. Exactly temperature takes off when growth takes off. And, uh, 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 and the counterfactual is that without the industrial revolution, you would have had no increase in temperature. Uh, in uh, China and India, that's where uh, CO2 emissions start taking up. It's exactly at the time where growth takes off. So the, historically, they are right. But should we be, you know, we had an episode of uh, uh, degrowth, of decroissance. It was the first lockdown. We were forced to be, uh, uh, you know, but the French GDP went down by 35% between March and May, June 2020. CO2 emissions went down by 8%. Would we want to be permanently in uh, the first lockdown? Well, we had to do it at the time. But, you know, we, we know all the negative side effects it has on our children and everything. And we don't want to be there permanently. So the other alternative is green innovation. The problem is innovation is not spontaneously green because firms that innovated in the past in dirty technologies, they tend to continue to innovate in the future in dirty technologies. That's what's called past dependence. You tend to continue doing what you are good at. So you need the state to redirect technical change towards clean technologies. You can do that with a carbon tax. It's very important. But you also do that with a, a green investments, green industrial policy, subsidies to green innovation. And we need both. Why do we need two instruments at least? Because there are two externalities. There is the environmental externality and there is this past dependence knowledge externality. So usually in public economics, when you have two externalities, you need at least two instruments and uh, you need these two legs. 
and uh, and uh, and you can show and there is work showing in particular that I did with uh, John Van Rien and showing that indeed firms that innovate more dirty in the past tend to innovate more dirty in the future but that you know you can redirect technical change alors what's very interesting is that you can redirect technical change uh, uh, with the fuel price you see if I increase the fuel price I increase clean innovation at the expense of dirty innovation so the carbon tax plays a role subsidy to green innovation plays a role as well but what's very interesting is that civil society plays a role as well and civil society it's consumers so that's the name and shame consumers in countries where they are pro environment they will uh, uh, they will tend to go for clean products and and uh, uh, all the more if you have more competition so uh, for example uh, patrick uh, uh, so uh, uh, you uh, no, you are clean. You are you are virtuous. I am the non virtuous. I am a non virtuous. You are virtuous producer. But first, I am monopoly. So even though I'm non virtuous, even if you have uh, 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 consumers that are uh, in demand of, of pro environmental uh, products, they have no choice but purchasing from me. Now, uh, 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 maybe they will purchase a bit less from me. But now you come in. I have competition from you, and that will force me to innovate clean to escape competition with you even though i am not virtuous because otherwise i lose my customers to you and you can see the combination of uh, uh, of, of this uh, value of consumers valuing the environment and competition is a very strong force it's, it's called it's shown here Con value is the extent to which uh, firm uh, uh, firms are facing on average across countries consumers that value environment competition is the extent to which uh, uh, on average they face uh, uh, co competition in the countries where they sell and you can see that you have a very significant composition effect between the two values in itself uh, pushes firms to innovate uh, uh, cleaner but uh, all the more when you have more competition and what we showed in recent work with Roland Benabou and Alexandra Roulet and Ralph Martin is that this force of uh, competition with value together it's like three times the increase in uh, carbon price that triggered the yellow vest. And the advantage of this is this doesn't trigger yellow vest. Well. So that's a force complementary to carbon tax and to subsidy, which, which, uh, which in fact in, in, uh, involves the civil society and which also is a very powerful force towards green innovation. So I can see already the triangle between firms that innovate, the state and civil society. I will get back to this triangle. And that's my uh, optimism of the will. It's true we face a bad problem, but we have forces, the state and civil society that can be mobilized to accelerate the energy transition. And, uh, uh, and that I think is a subject of, that's I think for optimism. That's the Lafont optimism there, okay? Okay, we arrive at the last part. Are you still there? I see that I lost yeah, someone there. Okay, so now I arrive at the last part. So uh, uh, degrowth is, is bad. In fact, if you, if you, I give you a trick. If you face a partisan of negative growth, you tell him or her, I give you the choice between a dentist of the 1950s and a dentist of nowadays. You remember, I don't know, you're not there, but you remember the old dentist was awful. And you force the person to go to the dentist of the 1950s. I convert that person immediately into a pro-growth person. Try the dentist thing, give the choice. That's that's radical. I think I, that's my recommendation. Okay, so um, rethink capitalism. So the the COVID uh, uh, was a revelator. It was a revelator of uh, uh, it revealed. Hello, it revealed uh, uh, how bad the social model of the U.S. is. Quoi. You don't want to be uh, uh, without human capital and in poor condition. I remember at MIT. You remember Jean. You know, we have assistants at MIT or Harvard. Whenever they got sick, there was panic. They were in panic. But Emily, it was quite in panic. Quand ils étaient malades, as soon as you got sick there and you are not wealthy, you, uh, you are panicking. I remember, you know, I was driving. Someone picked me up a limousine, but it was not a limousine, expensive limousine, from Washington to Philadelphia. And the guy said, "You know, see this house? That was my house. I had to sell it because my my wife got cancer." And to cure the cancer, I had to sell my house. Now we live in a, in a one bedroom. And that's, that's the US, okay? 
and we are very fortunate in France not to be there, not to be there yet. Bon. Uh, uh, so on social model, US does poorly. And on, uh, uh, but on, on innovation, Europe is not as good as the US. So for let me show me uh, some figures. Here I'm showing you uh, uh, the green curves are, uh, uh, the, the gray curves are the US and the black curves are Germany. Uh, the triangles are the share of population unemployed. It went up a lot during COVID in the US, okay? The, the, the circles are the share uh, of population without health insurance. In the US, when you lose your employment, you have a probability of losing your health insurance. So you can see at a time where they needed health insurance, they, they, some of them lost health insurance. In Germany, everybody has health insurance. I could have put France, it would be like Germany. So you see, we are better at insuring against uh, something like COVID. But it could be also the share here now, the circles are the fraction of population uh, at risk of poverty. It increased in the US. And what's beautiful, by the way, there, that was Obamacare. You see Obamacare, the beauty of it? You see, it really worked. It really worked. That's amazing. Okay, so uh, I go down to the uh, uh, risk of poverty. The, the, when you lose your employment, you, it increases your probability of being at risk of poverty in the US, but uh, in Germany, through COVID, it remained constant. You see, that's another. Another thing, of course, you look at Gini index. Gini is a measure of global inequality. It's bigger in the US than it is in uh, Scandinavia, France, uh, Germany. Uh, the poverty rate is higher in the US than it is in our countries, okay? And that's the bad thing. The other bad thing is the uh, Deaton case Deaton. Uh, they looked at the mortality of middle-aged, uh, unskilled, uh, white non-Hispanics, because the, the, the Hispanics and, 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 and non-whites already it was hell for them. That's why. Yeah? So they look at the increase. They've been always in hell. But the hell goes up for the white non-Hispanics. And, uh, uh, and you can see that the mortality rate goes up a lot since 2000, unlike you know, uh, continental Europe. Alors, UK is not great, it's a, but it's not as bad as the US. But you see continental Europe, France, uh, Germany, we are okay, it goes down continuously, the mortality of unskilled uh, middle age, okay? And that's because when you lose, you're so afraid of losing your job that you take taking opioids, sleeping pills, uh, eating pizzas a lot and all that, quoi. and then you, your mortality goes up. Quoi. And, uh, 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 and that's really the downside of the US. Quoi. You don't want to have the social model of the US. On the other hand, uh, 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 when it comes to innovation, US is much better because here you can see that is the flow of triadic patents. Triadic patents are patents that are registered in USPTO, uh, US Patent Office, Japanese Patent Office, Europe. These are good patents. And you see the flow, the US flow is much above EU and uh, China, okay? And you can look at any measure uh, uh, you can look at measure, for example, patents, application per million inhabitant, top cited, top 5% cited patents, percentage of top cited patents. US is way above everybody because they have a fantastic ecosystem of innovation, well-funded universities, uh, NSF, NIH, uh, Howard Hughes Medi Medical Investigator, which is a fantastic uh, private sponsor uh, uh, or, uh, uh, organization to fund uh, long-term researchers. They have a fantastic ecosystem. Then they have venture capital, well-developed, institutional investors, well-developed to innovate in larger firms. They have the DARPA, the BARDA, but they have all this, which we don't have in France and Europe generally. So what we want is the, is the model of capitalism that combines the good aspect of the American model to be innovative with the good side of the European model to be protective and inclusive. Some of my colleagues believe that it's either or. If you choose to be more innovative, it has to be at the expense of being more you know, uh, inclusive and protective. And if you choose to be more protective and inclusive, it has to be at the expense of being more innovative. I think there are at least three policies that we can implement that makes us both more innovative and more inclusive and protective. One of them is flexi security, flex security on the labor market. The second one is education. Uh, uh, the third one is competition. So let me and I'll conclude like this. Flex security, I told you already about the death of despair in the US, okay? But uh, Alexandra Roulet uh, has, uh, uh, has analyzed the labor market in, in Denmark. You know that in Denmark, when you lose your job up to a certain level of salaries for two years, you get 90% of your salary. And then the, the state retrains you and helps you find a new job. If you refuse more than two jobs in your qualification, you, you lose your benefits. Look at the effect on a purchase of entitlement. She compares the health of a worker in a firm that closes down 
to the health of a, to, of a worker in a firm uh, that does not close down, but of an identical worker, uh, education, uh, experience, and age. So I compare, I do a diff in diff. I look at, uh, I have a worker of a given age, education, experience in a firm that closed down. I compare, I'm already beyond time, uh, in a firm that does not close down. And you see no effect on the purchase of antidepressants. No effect on of, of probability to visit hospital on security reasons and no effect on mortality. So they found a good system. And in fact, when they introduced that security system in the 90s in, in Denmark, it made creative destruction work much better because firms had the flexibility to hire and lay off. But then, it, but, so that was good for innovation, but workers were retrained and, and rebounded into the labor market. So that was a very smart way, flex security, to reconcile, to make creative destruction both productive and, and, and socially acceptable. So that's the first type of policy. Uh, and now I want to talk about education. Uh, we have a big problem in France. With, uh, uh, well, I want to tell you about education. So here I am looking at the probability of inventing as a function of parental income. And that's in the US, that's from the work by Bell, Shetty, Jaravel, Petkova, Ron Rinan in the Quarterly Journal of Economics 2019. You can see it's a J curve. When you have parents in the top income brackets in the US, you are much more likely to innovate. Same thing, UK, US historical data, work by Axigit, Grigsby, Nicholas. And that's work that I'm doing, I've done with Axigit, Haitinen, and Toivanen. And I was very surprised that the same should be true in Finland, because in Finland, education is completely free and they have very good PISA tests. So I was surprised at first. But you see, the Finnish enigma is that in, in, in Finland, when I, in fact, it's because the high earning parents are the highly educated parents and the highly educated parents, they transmit knowledge and aspirations to their children. So it's not so much because they pay for school, school is free, but they transmit the knowledge. And that's what makes them more likely to innovate. When you control for parental education, you see the curves flattens out the relationship between parental income. And, uh, but still, I told myself, look, with the system they have in Finland, it should be totally flat. Why should still parent education matter? Because, and now I found the answer, is because the reform in Finland, the one I would like France to do, but I don't know why it's not being done in France. I don't know uh, Pepe and Dice qui fait les autres. Hein? Uh, 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 what does he way to do the same reform as 1970 reform in Finland? In 1970, before 1970, education, they very much had the certificate d'études. Very few people in Finland would go all the way to uh, end of high school. And they managed to have them go to end of high school, but while keeping the quality and have you know, very much uh, small cl cl class size, uh, teacher very well paid and treated and very much retrained all the time. And third, tutorship of, of, of individual tutorship of, of, uh, of children in Finland. They have those three elements whom you know, we know from the work of Josh Angris are key ingredients into getting a good education outcome, okay? So they have that in Finland. And they did a reform in 1970. And look at the effect of a reform. Here I look at, as a function of father income, at the jump, the upward jump in the probability of inventing for children for, that went through the school system after 1970, before, after versus before. And you can see that for the children that are in that range, you see the, the jump is big, of course, much less there. But you see that it improved a lot the probability of inventing for those children, this education reform. So what we should do in France and elsewhere, it's a reform like Finland did. We have a big problem of lost Einsteins in our countries. Many smart children, but they are born to families that cannot give them the education and knowledge. Remember yesterday we were with Colette and uh, interacting with uh, uh, you know, uh, professors that we try to reach out to the parents in mathematics to help uh, you know, homework, children's homework, okay? And, uh, uh, what we have to do is a reform like that, because you see, it will make the economy more innovative by having more innovators, but also more inclusive because more people can innovate. So education is typically a reform that makes you both more innovative and more inclusive. And the third one, and I will finish there, is competition. You remember I told you the stagnation. Uh, you have these, these superstar firms that inhibit that uh, uh, inhibit the entry of new firms. Now, hopefully, I don't know if it's the Biden competition reform, but if you reform competition policy, what will happen is that you will make the economy more innovative by having more entrant innovation, 
But also, you remember when we talk about social mobility, that untrained innovation is good for social mobility. So by doing that, you will also increase social mobility and reduce inequality. So competition is also a policy that makes you more, more uh, innovative and more inclusive. At the end of the day, uh, the key, if I go back to the, remember Schumpeter, he was very pessimistic. He saw that the first innovators would turn into entrenched conglomerates that would prevent subsequent innovation. The first response is to say, let's have the state. The state can impose competition policy. The problem is that the state can be captured. We saw that with Korea. But now you could say maybe the judges can play a role. But uh, Jean has done work on the judges with Eric, and the judges can be biased. And they can be subject to noise. There is this book by Kahneman that shows you, you know, depending on whether uh, the baseball match was won the day before or not, the judge uh, decides very differently or whether it's before lunch or after lunch. So you cannot rely on judges so much or not, so, uh, not enough. And that's where civil society is very important to, to limit the extent of the corruption, to limit the extent to which these guys can capture these guys. And that's why the triangle is the response to the Schumpeter pessimism. You need to have a very active triangle between firms, uh, the state, and civil society. Civil society is the media, is the uh, associations, is the voters, and you need those three, those three elements to, to uh, avert the pessimistic. It doesn't mean uh, a prediction of Schumpeter. Okay, so here is the book, and that's the English version of uh, my book with Céline Antonin Simon Bunel, The Power of Creative Destruction. And, uh, uh, and here is a book, and, and next comes a, a book uh, which will be coming in July. We had a conference, um, you know, but, uh, after in fact, it was Emmanuel Farhi who initiated it, and then uh, with uh, uh, Ufuk Exiged and John Van Rinen. And uh, this conference gave rise to a, a conference volume, and the conference volume uh, is coming out in uh, July uh, 2023. And it's like 700 pages of uh, our own creative destruction. People who, who build on, you know, uh, continue work that uh, on this line of research and they are fantastically talented young researchers. And uh, I very much recommend that you read uh, this beautiful book that will come out in, uh, in July of next year. Thank you very much. I'm done. We have time for questions or maybe no? Yeah, we have time for questions. Yeah, yeah one question. Emmanuel. Um, thank you very much for this uh, fantastic entertaining lecture. It was very hard to, to read our mail, I think, for <laughs> during your talk. Um, about this big uh, GAFA firm, I mean, I, I think some of them at least are very big because of network externalities. I mean, you want to, and that's something with, which has, I think, nothing to do with. Uh, Preventing innovation is that if you use a telephone, you want to reach everybody. And so the first mover. So how do you see your paradigm with this very specific aspect of... Uh... Well, you see that then, of course, I, I won't tell you when I'm in front of you, of Jean, of Patrick, uh, and I'm not sure if you on competition policy, obviously. Uh, there is an issue there. Some elements really can make more competitive. Some elements you have to regulate, mm -hmm. and whenever you have something that looks like a natural monopoly or like a network, you, I guess, regulation has to be there to make sure that you don't discourage that, for example, data sharing is taking place. Or, uh, but there, they know much more than I do. How you can make sure that those firms do not discourage a new entry and new and, But I think it has to be each time not just look at market share, but look at the effect on new entry and new innovation. I think whatever it is, for. and I think that that should be the the chat right? maybe that that's already done, but maybe not enough. I think both in Europe and in the US, they have a very good thing, and I don't want to do any bad thing of competition policy. I think they've done a great thing, but maybe they do a bigger extent than the factor in one three years. It's not easy because how can you in advance if you are, you know, uh, maybe that's an exposed to see that entry has gone down and then you intervene in some ways and how you intervene. But that's, uh, but I would, I would not say network particular, I mean, and of course, uh, those who can answer the question, it's not really uh, useful, obviously, for 
to make it full of myself. <laughs> Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Uh, I have a question about um, this framework of creative destruction. Um, so when I think about Schumpeter or the Industrial Revolution or the electrification of the economy, these all occurred at times where energy supply was constantly growing. And now uh, if governments want to honor the 1.5 degrees Celsius, it's not so unlikely that we have to reduce energy consumption. So how would uh, your framework deal with this constraint? That, that precisely you want innovations that will make uh, fossil energy obsolete and that will make it possible to, to like finding new source of energy, uh, energy savings technologies, uh, and that will of course supersede the existing technology. So it will be all about creating this project. And in fact, I told you about the past dependence. The problem is the informants, the new firms who don't face the past dependence. So the first way to, to go is to already pay your pay infrastructure because the new firms, they don't have the budget the budget finance for that they were facing. So already great infrastructure at the start to get cheap. And then of course you want to make sure that you direct, you incorporate new firms in, uh, in in things that will of course make, and of course it means that there is a lot of obsolescence because you uh, all capital working with, with the, there's been this report in France by Dizani and Selma Marcus, they say that uh, huge capital already to implement existing technologies uh, to replace will mean will mean huge capital investment and and because they are typically more capital intensive the new the new technologies and will mean that some of the old capital working with dirty technologies will become obsolete so you need to make huge investment in capital uh, to already implement the, these new technologies that we have and while while pursuing research in the tomorrow's technologies you see and uh, you have to hold these two hands but it's all about creative destruction you have to capital obsolescence and to put new capital in place and the big issue is that we need to do that at the time where we have high debt and we, now we cannot do macroeconomics the same way as before we cannot look at the monetary debt without looking at the same time at ongoing time debt uh, we know that if we we delay uh, 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 energy transition we know it's more costly to do it tomorrow the more we delay, the, the bigger the gap, because firms will continue innovating in dirty technologies, the bigger the gap between dirty and clean, and therefore the pro prolong the period of lower growth, what meanwhile the dirty technology, the clean technology catches up with the dirty. So delaying investment uh, uh, is bad. If you look at think of future generations, if you say in the name of monetary policy, I delay investment uh, uh, in uh, energy transition, I will leave. Uh, what they will inherit is a bigger environmental debt. So you want to look at the monetary debt and the environmental debt together. And uh, also interest rate, inflation, can we just rely on interest rate? When we just rely on monetary policy, we have to increase interest rate a lot. But then it's for a long time in investment, starting in the green investment. So you see that now, when you factor in uh, energy transition, you completely change macroeconomics. I mean, you have to do, and it's all about replacing old technologies by new technology. And there is a huge cost of transition to make that replacement. So there is a new field which is macroeconomics and energy transition, which is a totally new field. And I think there is plenty to do. I encourage everybody here to work on this. What I think of all of this is that I don't think people should move to Macro. No. <laughs> and, and no, and Macro, and Macro people should move to IO. No, absolutely. But that's the whole point. They will do growth without IO, but never. <laughs> Excusez-moi, just a little word for those who want to join the mairie. The entry principal, by the market, it's not possible, you have to pass by the back. 
la rue Rechasse au niveau du donjon. Et voilà, c'est tout. À 18h. On a le temps, hein. on a le temps. Là.